Hello, everyone. Thank you for dropping by. <laughs> Good morning. Um, yeah, it's because of you the session is happening, because of you three people. <laughs> um, but good to have you here. Uh, my name is Hamid Akhtar, and I'm part of Percona's Postgres engineering team. Um, today I'm going to discuss about Postgres query performance insights. So this is kind of an attempt to look at what's available and how query performance can be analyzed using the tools that are available. So uh, a few things about myself. So. Um, more than two decade, decades of professional software development experience. Um, I've been programming long before that, actually. Um, so I'm part of Percona's Postgres engineering team, and I'm, uh, I've been part of Percona for more than a year now. Uh, you'll see some of my talks as I was in a technical product management role prior to this, but I preferred an engineering role, so that, that uh, it, it's been a recent role switch for me. Uh, so prior to joining Percona, I was with Hygo, which is a Postgres company, and prior to that with Enterprise DB, where one of the things um, that you might have used uh, were Postgres official one-click installers. So those were managed and done by my team, um, and we for OS X and Windows, and previously we used to have them for Linux distributions as well. And occasionally we used to work with DevRim, uh, so some of the RPM packages and changes like PowerPC related and um, SUSE related were kind of exchanged with DevRim as well. In case you need to reach out to me, um, here is my email address, LinkedIn. You can always add me on LinkedIn and message me there. I'm more responsive there. Uh, Skype handle is available as well, um, though I'm less active on Skype these days. You can also reach out to Percona. So uh, we have a pretty good open culture. Um, and this is a community forum uh, where you can drop any message and rest assured that it'd be looked at uh, by the teams. And we get bugged by our community team to respond to certain questions. <laughs> so um, and you can come and talk to us about any Postgres related MySQL, Mongo, PMM, or PGSAT monitor related issues. Um, you can also look at our GitHub. Um, Anything that we do is open source, and it has um, reasonable licenses as well. So uh, in case you want to contribute, you can always do that. And finally, feel free to share the word. Um, Percona Live is the hashtag. Let people know you're here. Um, and let's carry on. Um, so uh, some initial thoughts. Um, so query. Uh, observing query performance, um, when I see it, I look at it from a holistic picture. So it's not just about what the Postgres server is doing or the database server is doing. It's also about the ability to track that request to the actual uh, eventual execution. So it's about connection information, how that connection was made, uh, whether there were some things configured during connection that uh, we need to know. Um, and so it's really important that you can you have the capacity to trace back to the application because different applications might be issuing the same query, but it, there is a possibility that it can be executed rather differently. And I'll explain later why that's important. Um, so the first and foremost is the ability to know uh, or the application that's um, executing the query, the connection information, and then the query text. Um, so query text, in cases of Postgres, certain extensions, what they do is uh, the constant string literals or values are replaced with placeholder value, placeholders. Now, that becomes a challenge if you want to rerun that query, because you have placeholders and you don't have actual values. So it can be any value that, and the result, or say it's a filter clause, and the results can be drastically different from one to a million rows, uh, but depending on the value that's being passed. So really important that you can you have the capacity uh, to uh, look at what the actual query text was. Um, then it's about execution plan. Um, so what was actually, how it was planned to be executed. Um, so that's important uh, because you want to know how the server reacted to that query, how it understood it, and how it, it kind of evaluated and defined an execution plan for it. Uh, obviously, you want to know the planning and uh, execution statistics. Um, and Execution statistics are really uh, what will then 
help you understand and tune um, your Postgres um, setup as well. Block reads, whether you're reading from uh, the heap or the relation, um, or whether it's an index being hit. So what kind of blocks are being read? Are you uh, missing the cache frequently, uh, more frequently than not? Uh, is there a lot of IO happening? Um, so again, that's critical uh, if you're evaluating query performance. Um, and uh, then it's about wait events and locks. Is something holding back query from executing? Are there any steps that are being blocked? Um, so really good information to know what's, what's happening out there and what's causing the trouble. Um, so let's start with um, the very basics. Um, let's start how the Postgres will evaluate a query. Um, so explain and analyze are the, the two uh, magic words that will help us understand. Um, there are five components to query processing uh, job. So when a query is received by Postgres, it starts with parser, analyzer, and rewriter. Parser and analyzer are really making sure that the query is written, written correctly. Um, the, there are no issues, uh, syntax issues. And then rewriter does some transformations on it. So it kind of, think, think of it more in terms of refining that query tree. Um, because the query, for it needs to be optimized for then planning. So there would be have some transformations in there. And then that refined query tree is passed on to the planner. Um, so the planner now needs to then break it down and see how that query can be best executed. It will evaluate comparative approaches. And based on certain parameters, it's going to then identify how that execution should eventually take place. The executor just follows orders. Whatever planner has told it, whatever it's been decided and written for it, it just needs to execute that. Um, so moving on, so it's about then understanding how that plan got generated, or what are the artifacts and what are the, how we can analyze plan generally. Um, so that is where the explain command comes in. It tells us about the query execution plan. Um, from a very basic point of view and very basic explain command output and the simplest form, um, we see that the explain um, command uh, presents us with certain uh, values. Um, so it tells us, for example, that it's going to um, have a sequential scan on tank one relation. And then there it presents us in brackets a couple of value, uh, uh, four values. The first is cost, and then ellipsis followed by another cost, then total number of rows, and width. The important thing to note is that the explain command does not actually execute the query. So the query has not been executed. Um, the startup cost is the cost that will be incurred before we can start emitting rows to the client or uh, to the next uh, node. So in this case, it will go out to the client. So there is no startup cost, which means that it can, it can start emitting rows immediately. It doesn't have to wait for it. It would have had to wait had there been, say, a sort operation. So you can't just emit rows immediately. You would have to sort and make sure that the sorted rows are then presented. So there would be some initial startup cost in that case. Um, and then the second cost parameter tells you the total cost. Um, this is uh, the cost is an arbitrary uh, kind of number for effort, um, and it has no real world association. So you can't really say that's uh, like time or anything. It's just arbitrary number that is there for comparison purposes, and then evaluating that in context of multiple approaches if they're available. Finally, it's a uh, number of rows. Um, so. The query has not been executed, um, but we still know the number of rows. That's coming from the statistics table. And the statistics table may or may not be up to date. So if you've not analyzed it recently, um, it might be out of date. And there might have been a few operations. And this, can, this number can be very wrong at times. Um, and then you have the width. That's the expected number of bytes per row. So that's an average kind of. Uh, estimate. So multiplying the rows and the width, you can basically get um, the total number of bytes that are going to be returned as part of this query. So um, this is what the basic explain command tells us. 
As I've mentioned, cost is an arbitrary unit. Um, so with, it has to have some kind of real world association, not with any units, but in some way or form, in some actions. So that in this particular case, in our case, it's cost when um, by default is set to one for a sequential page scan from disk. So when you read one page, which is um, by default an 8K page for Postgres, um, that's evaluated to as a cost one. Now, all the numbers are then evaluated in context of this cost. So it's, it's basically um, further, so basically you set a unit and then according to that you, you, I mean, you basically evaluate whether you're going to incur double the effort four times or half of it. So that's how it, it works. So page cost can be sequential or it can be random. Um, sequential page cost um, is one. Random page cost by default is four. Uh, so you're going to incur four times the effort if you're going to read random pages. Why would that be? Because you're not really optimizing it for cache. You're not really optimizing it for OS. So that random access would basically be jumping back and forth, potentially. So it's not an optimal way of reading. So if you are to read a page, a, a, a table or a file, you're better off reading the entire file sequentially rather than reading random blocks because then you're not really benefiting, benefiting from any optimization that the kernel or the um, hardware may have. Um, and the cost of four was originally set for mechanical disks. With um, SSDs and NVMEs, you can set it to lower and normally the recommended is 1.1. So it's very close to the sequential scan. Um, then you have CPU costs. And there are multiple types of CPU costs. So the operation for CPU is either you're processing a tuple, you're uh, processing an index entry, or processing an operator. Um, how this gets evaluated, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, the cost for tuple, processing a tuple is 0 0.01. So it's one, um, it's basically, uh, I think, 100, uh, so 0 0.01. Uh, and then index entry is half of that, and operator is half of that. So that's how those costs are evaluated. And they, in the overall cost calculation, um, they are based on the number of rows estimated. These costs are then multiplied, and uh, overall value for the cost is then um, calculated. There are parallel costs, um, whether you want to engage parallel workers. But the catch here is that there would be some overhead, and that's a significant overhead for parallel workers. As you spawn parallel workers, you're going to incur a significant cost. So I think more in terms of like a 10,000 cost parameter. Uh, so you're going to add that much if you're going to incur or initiate parallel workers. Because spawning those workers would have a significant overhead. And if your transaction is, or um, overall the cost is very small, then that does, it doesn't make sense to have uh, parallel workers initiated. Uh, like for one, if you're going to fetch one tuple, you're better off maybe having one worker rather than 10 workers. Um, a little more complex query plan looks something like this. Um, some uh, complex keywords, some, uh, so you, you see, for example, materialized, you see the bitmap, the index scan, bitmap index scan, um, you see joins. Um, so what, what the planner has done is it's very smartly optimized some of the operations here. Um, it's a join, so what it's predicted is that it does not have to read both tables every time for every row, but rather it can materialize one, so, and it can loop through the other one. Um, and uh, as we were discussing about the index scan, so indexes aren't really, uh, while a relation, if you create it, for example, it doesn't really matter how that data is maintained, because once you go to the disk, you're effectively going to read sequentially most of the time. But indexes, they get updated over a period of time. Uh, so does relations. But for index, you, the key is, um, or the challenge with indexes is that you are reading uh, in a random order. Um, tables, when you go to the disk, you're effectively going through a sequential scan then. So you're going to read multiple pages. But index, you expect to read um, two bytes, and they can be far apart, or you might be hitting the same 
a disk pa the same page twice. Um, so a page will contain multiple, may contain multiple tuples. So an index entry one can be on page one, an index entry of 100 can also be on page one. So there, for example, there was an update. Um, or there was an insertion, another insertion. So you've, you've added another value in there. Um, so what this, um, what, uh, what the plan, planner has done, it's, it's created a bitmap heap scan. Um, so it's kind of built a bitmap, uh, kind of a list of pages that it needs to fetch, rather than fetching them immediately. So it's kind of delayed that fetch process, it's organized them, and it's kind of then uh, made it more of a sequential access rather than a completely random access. So now you have a list of pages that you need to fetch, so which means that you're not going to fetch pages uh, multiple times, uh, the same page many times, but rather you're going to fetch it just once, and uh, it's less back and forth uh, movement then. Um, so query plan uh, is a tree of plan nodes, uh, and the bottom ones are the scan nodes always. Um, and uh, there you can have a sequential scan, an index scan, uh, a bitmap index scan. Uh, there is, you can have an index only scan as well. Um, and you have uh, non-table row sources as well, uh, where you can have a function giving out a set or value clauses. Now, the explain command can be prepended with the analyze keyword. What th that does is, while the explain wasn't really executing the query, analyze does. And that's what really helps uh, uh, us kind of tune those costing parameters because now you have a real world association. You have the actual times, so you have a time and a cost parameter. So you can see, for example, that actual time is 1.777 milliseconds, uh, but the cost was zero. And similarly, you have a total actual time and a total cost. So this is where you can uh, basically see if the numbers are skewed significantly and you can then optimize or update your um, costing parameters based on your hardware environment. It's returned pretty similar information. So total number of rows is returned. Uh, it tells you about the loops um, and also the planning time, which you can also get if you do uh, verbose if, with explain. So, and, um, So, um, just what I've previously explained, so explain, uh, analyze, tells you, it basically helps evaluate those uh, arbitrary cost numbers with real world values. Um, it provides with the actual execution time, um, and it provides us with a lot more uh, kind of real world uh, details. You can add buffers, and you can see how the buffers are being hit as well. So you can understand it from that perspective as well. The tools. Um, so these are the tools that are freely available. So no, no restrictions, but they, they serve a different purpose. All of these, um, and they complete the entire picture in terms of traceability of that query from the application to the eventual execution. Um, the first one is a view, uh, PG stat activity that comes with the Postgres core. Um, you don't have to do anything, it's just available out there uh, once you install Postgres. The next is PG stat statement, it's the most commonly used extension in Postgres. Um, it has, it's basically a, a huge list of statistics, um, so it's a, it's a massive set, uh, and those numbers at times do provide a challenge interpreting what's going on. Um, then it's auto-explain. Uh, auto-explain is um, PG stat statement and auto-explain are both part of Postgres uh, core, but they're available under contract. So you're not going to have them uh, available if you're building from source, uh, just the Postgres. You'd have to build these extensions separately, and if you're installing it from packages, you'll see a contract module separately. The installer will carry both um, extensions by default. Then PG Badger is kind of the odd one out. It's, it's not uh, an extension, it's not a view, it's an external tool. Um, and um, there, 
it has very good useful information. That's why it's here. Uh, and it's free. Uh, again, uh, no, no proprietary solutions here. Uh, finally, PGStat Monitor. Uh, that's the product that Procona just released this month. For Postgres, the version 1.0 is available. Um, looking at PGStat activity to start with. Um, so it's a view in a PG catalog schema. It tells you really what's happening in Postgres right now. So it's, it's the current picture of the server. It has one row per connection, and that information uh, is very useful because it has a lot of details that are valuable in understanding what that backend is currently doing. Um, so it starts with connection information, you, which includes database, uh, anything that you need to know about that connection. So uh, it has a database name, username, client, IP, uh, host name. It can have if you've enabled log host names, uh, GUC. So otherwise, it would not be translating um, the host uh, into host names, uh, the IP address. Uh, since there would be a slight performance impact, that's why it's disabled by default. It does have port, and it does have provide you with application name um, and the backend type. So you can see the server backend uh, processes as well. Um, the application name is good to have, uh, but under some cases, um, that application name might get obfuscated with if you have a pooler or a um, load balancer uh, in, in the middle. What, what this really helps with is understanding the aging transactions. Uh, it has uh, details in terms of timestamps. And those timestamps are connection and state uh, and transaction related details. So when was the state last changed? Um, has, is this an idle uh, connection is, or is it an active one? Um, is it an idle in transaction? So it provides you with that state of that current uh, backend. It also tells you if it's waiting on something. Is, is that backend waiting on client read? Is that waiting for the server to do something? Is that waiting on a lock? What, what exactly is it waiting on if it's waiting on something? So it, it does classify in very detail um, the events. So PGStat activity tells us about the connection and application details. Um, the things of interest is if the state is idle in transaction, um, have you configured idle in transaction timeout properly? Um, should this transaction, should this backend still be here, or should uh, this be terminated by Postgres? Um, the other thing is, although it seems like this should really shouldn't really be here, idle in transaction aborted. Um, that's a backend that we should expect to go away. But in case you have save points in your transaction, it could possibly mean that it's uh, it's fallen back to a save point. So. These are also of interest because something has gone wrong and that connection is still there. Um, state change, when was the state last changed? Um, that's a clear indication whether this connection is actually doing something. Uh, again, it's about client read or write, whether the client has opened this connection and not done anything and we're just waiting on client to issue a query or do something. Um, so aging transaction, why are they important? Um, aging transactions are, um, are, are basically the, the, the worst thing that can happen to a, a database server. Um, I, I've got given two talks previously, and every time I discuss aging transaction come in, whether that's replication, whether that's high availability. Aging transaction in any environment are going to cause issues because they're going to hold back key resources. They would not let, for example, the vacuum clean up things. They could be holding locks. Um, and they can hold locks for any reason, good or bad, uh, which means that they might end up building a queue. They could even hold back, um, create index concurrently. If you're, if you're trying to save, um, uh, your, um, or if you're trying to avoid a exclusive lock on a table and you're issuing an index create with concurrent keyword, aging transactions can still hold that back. Uh, any weight events that are not null, uh, those are to be investigated further. Unfortunately, what where it misses out, PGStat activity, is that it's the current state. So if the connection came and went away, uh, albeit it took 10 times more time than it should have, uh, it, that information would not be there after a while. So uh, that information 
has disappeared from the records. Um, and you would have to go to log files if all the details are, if log parameters are enabled. So it's the current state and it doesn't maintain a history. PG stat statement, this is the most popular contrib module that's out there. Um, it has huge number of statistics information. Um, and it tracks queries, it tracks planning, it tracks execution, it tracks um, uh, anything that's being executed by the server. So it's not um, database-wise, but it's um, server-wise, really, the implementation. Um, the thing to note here is um, when you, um, as part of the extension, what happens is that um, any extension that is supposed to be preloaded, once that's preloaded, uh, it basically per becomes part of the server. So it doesn't matter if you've created the SQL extension for it, but that preloading means that it's injected and added uh, its functions into the hook uh, hooks uh, and it's going to be called. So it's going to maintain information. So SQL extension creation is not necessary. It's still going to capture that and it's still going to cause a performance deg degradation. So if you've added it um, just to avoid a server restart, you might want to consider um, that. Uh, prior to version 14, it, what, it needed, what it did was um, it generated a query hash. Now that query hash needed to be generated uh, without the constant string literals because even changing of ID from say ID is equal to one to ID is equal to two uh, should not really be considered a new query. So what it did was it replaced those constant values with placeholders. So it replaced that ID is equal to one to ID is equal to dollar one. And what it did not tell uh, the user as to what values was replaced. It's, it's basically per query based um, accumulation of statistics over time. Um, by default, it maintains 5,000 queries. Uh, and as those more queries come in, um, it recycles, so it gets rid of the old queries. So it, it's very careful in terms of not consuming too much space. You could do a reset. Um, prior, again, prior to version 14, um, there was no information as to when this view was last reset. So it could have been that data could have been a month old, a year old, um, but now that reset information maintains how many times the allocation has been done and how many times, um, um, uh, yeah, how many, uh, when was it last reset? So you, you know exactly the, when these statistics were gathered. Uh, with PG14, uh, and that jumble query mechanism has been shifted to Postgres core, the comp and it's now uh, uh, as part of a GUC, which is a compute query ID. If you have it enabled, Postgres uh, PG stat statements will work and it will collect the data. If it's disabled, it's not going to collect any data. Um, it has a huge number of columns, so 33 columns and most of them, pretty much all of them are numbers. So uh, it has min, max values, it has uh, um, standard deviations, it tells you about blocks, it tells you about um, read and writes, it tells you about times, it tells you about the planning time. If you have track planning enabled, uh, by default it's off because again that does degrade performance uh, a wee bit as well. Um, so it, it provides with a lot of these detailed information um, with planning times and uh, so it, you have a query ID, uh, you know the query, uh, you don't know the actual query but you know the query with placeholders. Uh, and then you have corresponding execution time and uh, the block read and writes. You have wall read and writes and in version 15 that's about to come out, they've also add just-in-time compilation uh, statistics as well. So you'll see that I think six or seven columns additionally have been added uh, to these 30, 33. This is probably um, the biggest view outside the catalog that's, that's there. I think PG class has, or uh, PG attribute has a huge number of um, columns and this has significantly, uh, significantly large as well. Um, it also tells you about, for example, uh, and it differentiates between blocks, whether it's a shared, local, or temp block. Um, so if, if you're, a lot of temp blocks are being written, 
you, it will tell you that your work mem is not sufficient. Uh, that needs to be optimized. You need to increase that. Um, if uh, there being a lot of read and writes, you can assess whether you're uh, reading from relation or index. That information is also provided. How many times it, uh, a block has been uh, dirtied. You can get some of this buffer information with explain analyze as well for per query basis. Uh, but this, as an, this is an accumulation here. So it tells you about, for example, um, wall statistics as well, like full page images. Um, and that's, that's useful, again, if you're going to evaluate in context of replication. Um, PG stat statements info, that's the view that I, I discussed where it keeps a track of how many times the allocation has been done and when was this last reset. So it gives you a context in terms of um, date and time since when these uh, statistics were being collected. So, um, I mean, w one of the examples that you'll find in the documentation is about hit ratio for this um, and um, how you can optimize things then. So this is a query straight from the documentation uh, with PG Bench, uh, and you can see that hit percentage from 100 to 98. Um, it looks like a two percentage drop, but in actual terms, it's a significant drop uh, if we're talking about cash. Because the overhead of cash misses is far too much, uh, and it's significant in its order of uh, multiple, uh, order of tens rather than uh, single digits. So it, it does cause significant issue. The problem with PG stat statements is that, unfortunately, being an accumulation of uh, statistics, um, it cannot tell you uh, a time or time of the day or a window wise, uh, basically. Um, statistics. So if you have a load on the server or for some odd reason you have a query that ran very slow for no, and you knew why it ran slow, it, it will offset those outliers uh, in PG SAT statement. So the max will, uh, or timing or the max um, uh, values will now reflect that uh, query which was expected to run slow because say a backup was being taken or somebody was configuring something, or maybe you were debugging something. So it, it will have that challenge where that accumulation and that data gets offset, so you don't get an actual uh, data based on time of the day and when the load was expected, but rather overall, and unless you reset it, uh, and then you lose data, obviously. It provides you with planning statistics, but it does not provide you with the plan. So it tells you, for example, how many times the query has been planned and how much time was taken to plan this query, but it does not give you the plan. So it's, it's kind of like half the picture, not the entire one. The other problem with this is that it's offering you uh, the query, but um, it does not really parse it to the extent where it can pick up the relation and views and will help you facilitate in terms of identifying whether which relation or views are uh, like the common element in all slow queries. You can do parsing yourself, but then that's, that's an overhead for the user and being able to correctly parse that query and write um, that parsing uh, regular expression will take time and effort. It does not provide you with actual parameters. Why this is important? Because uh, say if you have um, non-deterministic values, you have a random number and you have less than a random number, that can be a million returning a million rows and that can change how the planner will actually then build the plan. Because if you have a million rows in the relation, it's better to return the entire relation rather than do an index scan. But if that random value turns out to be one or two, then it's just going to return one row. So that's why those parameter values are important. It does not provide you with the spread of timing data. That's, that's one of my biggest concern with PGSAT statements. Um, so for example, uh, although you have the minimum, maximum, mean, uh, sum of variance, and standard deviation. You have these statistics and the timings. Um, but you, you can see, for example, in these two tables, and looking at the bottom rows for those, standard deviation is identical for both. Uh, query uh, min is the same. Query max is the same. Mean is different. Uh, but with 
three numbers identical, it's very hard to evaluate what's, what's wrong with this. Um, so what, what it would not tell you is that, for example, PG stat statements would not be able to help you identify that this query ran slow uh, and significantly slow three times. So you have time that's 1,000 milliseconds, another 1,000, and another 3,000. While looking at the second one, second table, it's 500 and 3,000. So that's a significant drop in terms of um, issues. Um, next is auto explain. So this is a non-SQL extension. So there's no SQL interface. What it does is it dumps the query plan um, in the log file. Now, um, when, when I started discussing um, the tools and the observ uh, observability and the holistic picture, um, and one of the things I mentioned was that uh, the plan can be different for the same query from two different applications. Uh, why could that be uh, the case? So in my personal experience, we were debugging an issue where a query uh, was taking about three and a half hours uh, from the application. And that same query, when you copy paste that, copy from the application, paste it in psql, was taking in milliseconds. Uh, it was a huge table. Uh, it was like, uh, I think that table had about a billion rows, but still, uh, it was managing to do that. Now, what was happening behind the scene was that one of the JDBC driver was typecasting a value, a filter clause value, uh, a column value, in fact, um, to what was not in the table. So it was typecasting that value, and that could not have been predicted looking at the application or looking, copying, pasting that query. So what really AutoExplain helped us with is that it immediately identified that for the application, we're having a sequential scan on the entire table with a billion rows. Um, whereas when we run it from the SQL, we're getting an index scan. Um, and that was a huge benefit because what would have taken us ages to identify was done in minutes. Um, so with that piece of information, we could then go back to the application and we could fix that problem there, uh, which was happening. Um, it's very similar to explain command. So it's very similar to dumping uh, that output and it has very similar configuration parameters. What it also has is a log bin duration, um, which means that you can configure that if a query takes this much time or more than that, just in that case, log it but do not do it for every query. So rather than adding that overhead and being dumping that for every query, you could do that by configuring this to zero. But you can also specify that if query takes more than 30 seconds, I would want to know why, what was the plan for that query. And it gets dumped into the log. So unfortunately, it wouldn't have a SQL interface and you'll have to go and pick up the log files. Um, but it provides you with all the details like with uh, explain and explain analyze that we discussed earlier. So we get the plan from here. Um, yeah, so um, an innocuous query may, may, may look like, or an innocuous change may look like pretty safe, nothing to do with query performance, but it might just mess up the entire execution. Um, the problem is that you have to go outside the SQL interface, whether you're using PG admin or whether you're using psql, you now have to go to uh, the log files and log parsing. Um, you have to initiate a log parsing activity to pick up the query plan from this. Now that's, that kind of is, is a put off, um, but, but it's useful occasionally, but you can't do it on a regular basis then. PG Badger, um, this is a fast paced log analyzer in Perl. Uh, it's, just a one, it's just one huge file um, with everything included in it. So, it's not does not require any complex environment or setup. Um, what it does is it does it very um, smartly picks up the information from the log files um, as long as you have those log parameters enabled, and it summarizes that information and provides you with all the details. So, for example, it's going to tell you about the top ten queries that ran for most of the time, the top ten queries that held the log logs uh, most. Um, so it, um, with this, you have to be careful about how much log you're going to generate and how much detail you need. Um, on, 
on, on my laptop with a couple of things, on, in 15 minutes I could generate a 4 GB of log file with, with everything enabled. So um, the good thing about this is that um, it can process um, the log files with multiple cores. It has a minus J option which engages multiple cores and then processes that log file quickly. Uh, and it generates, it can generate multiple uh, output formats. The HTML one is uh, pretty reasonable, though it's not, um, and, and you, could, you could basically use it uh, in a browser and um, see how, how it look um, and get all the information you need. Um, yeah, so with all the useful information, it can help you identify and tune certain GUCs. For example, WorkMem is one that you can immediately identify because it tells you about uh, the temporary files that are being generated. So this is what it looks like uh, with menus on top. And you can see, for example, it's covering a lot of these details, whether those are session of temporary files, vacuum, locks, uh, queries, or top X uh, uh, for that. Uh, parsing log files can take time. Um, you, you can set up a cron job which ships out um, the log files on a regular basis to another system as if you can, in case you don't want to do it on the, uh, the log file processing on the same uh, system as the server. Um, what it does additionally is that it can uh, pick up log file segments. So it can pick up a daily log file and generate a weekly report in the end as well. So it, it does facilitate and accumulating that those seg files and generating a summary at the end. Unfortunately, the HTML interface is not responsive, which means that it will not reorient itself for, a brow for your uh, smaller screens, whether uh, on a tablet or on a phone. So it's not really uh, that, that nice. Um, the last of the lot is PG Stat Monitor. This is an extension that we've just released this month. Uh, and I'll explain why uh, I think this is a good, good extension to have. Um, so it, it kind of analyzes query performance in a very different context. If you're familiar with, uh, with SAR on Linux, uh, so which basically gathers statistics over time, and you can query it for time windows and assess it when, say, based on time of the day or week, uh, and get the load information. This does that in a very similar way. It carries all the data from PGStat activity, uh, sorry, from PGStat statements, and it picks up a lot of good information from PGStat activity. So it's, it has the connection information like PGStat activity, and it also has the statistic columns of PGStat statements. Uh, furthermore, it also has the capacity to uh, show the actual query plan, just like auto explain. So it, it can tell you about the connection, it can tell you about the statistics, and it can also give you about the, uh, tell you about the plan. Um, so it's like a combina combination of all three, um, and it gives you all of this in a SQL interface. What it does is that it, it, it has a bug time bucketing system, which means that it um, will save based on the, uh, information based on uh, the time buckets. And these are configurable, so you can set as many buckets as you want. You can have like an hour, um, you can have bucket time for an hour, and you can have 24 buckets, which means that you'll capture that data for the entire day in 24 separate buckets, and that will really help assessing load, whether, say, um, at 3 a.m. in the morning, you can assess what kind of load you had in case you want to run some uh, backup uh, uh, um, if you, you want to take a backup, um, you know that whether you should do it at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., um, you can uh, analyze those query performance patterns. By default, we've configured it as 10 buckets of one minute each, um, and buckets get rotated. Uh, so it's a kind of like a circular queue. So once it uh, goes past 10, it will uh, reset the first bucket, and it will uh, start using it. So it, uh, you can configure the amount of shared memory it's going to consume, and um, so it's it's not a memory hog in any way. Um, it's it's reasonably safe. Um, so what it does is that uh, the overall traceability of that query it picks up on the key 
uh, attributes. PG stat statements was accumulating data based on just query ID, uh, the query hash that was gen being generated. What PG stats monitor does very differently is it uses bucket ID, it differentiates a query being run by a different user on a different database um, from a different client, uh, and it can also tell you about uh, whether a different plan was generated for this, and it can tell you the application name as well and whether this was a top level or a nested query. Uh, so it, it can tell you a lot of those details as well. Uh, and it's basically this grouping that differentiates that and that helps debugging process because say you have the same query run by the same client, but the plan changed. Uh, you would not know that with PGSAT statements, but here it will end up creating a new row uh, and you would know that a plan changed looking at all the other parameters you be able to immediately identify why this plan changed, whether something was tweaked, whether somebody just uh, tuned something. Um, so it has more than 50 columns. Um, all of the columns in PG stat statements are here, plus there are additional columns. Um, and it does have a lot of other useful information, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, similar to PG stat statements, you can turn off the planning part because planning always means that you have basically initiated another process in the query uh, processing job, which will slow down any query. Um, so you can turn it off. Uh, I think it will just slow it down by a two or three percent, but that's significant if you uh, if you're not really using it. Uh, if it's turned off, all the planning-related columns will have empty values. Um, that's I, I guess understandable. So. Um, Application and client information, so you, you know, for example, uh, you can have the application name, you can have the port, and all the details that you would want from client uh, in here. Um, what it also does is that since buckets are being recycled, so it does not just maintain kind of a reference to the top query, but it also maintains top query text as part of the query itself. Because that top query could have been executed and could have been uh, part of a different bucket that got recycled. Uh, so this also ensures that you have that complete set of information with you. It provides the context uh, in terms of uh, relations and views as well. So it has a separate column that has a list um, and it tells you, for example, what this query, what relations or what views this query actually touched. So now you have, you can look at it from a table or a view perspective and you can analyze the statistics based on that whether uh, there's a common culprit in all of those slow queries, uh, and that's one relation that's, that needs to be vacuumed. Uh, additionally, you can save uh, metadata. Uh, so similar to a SQL, uh, Google SQL Commenter, you can save the comments in your queries, and they will be preserved in a separate column. Now, why is that useful? It has very specific benefit as well. Uh, so you can, for example, save specific information, but what it also does is it can look through any intermediate layer, whether you have an HA proxy or a, a, a connection pooler, PG bouncer, or PG pool. The application can identify itself through a SQL comment, and that information will be maintained. It can identify its IP address uh, through a SQL comment, and that will be preserved separately. So rather than you seeing that same IP address of HA proxy or um, a connection pooler, you can now pass that information through. It provides you with a histogram. So this was one of the concerns with PG stat statements that it does not provide you with the spread of that data. This maintains a histogram. Um, and it can tell you, for example, the first query ran in zero to three milliseconds twice, and then it ran between 10 and 31 milliseconds once. It's a on a logarithmic scale rather than a linear, linear one because you would want to capture uh, the data over a longer period of time rather than creating a huge number of um, slots. It was released this month, uh, and it's available on percona.com as part of our distribution, and it's also available in yum.postgres.org. It's available currently for version, uh, on yum.postgres, it's currently available for version 12 and onwards. Um, they're fixing one issue with uh, version 11. Just to summarize, um, 
so the use case really is if you want connection information, you have stat activity and stat monitor. Stat monitor preserves that data, stat activity does not. Um, if you want query text, you have PG Badger, you have PG Stat Statements, and you have PG Stat Monitor. PG Stat Monitor will expose query, um, uh, uh, not just placeholders, but actual constant literals as well. So it's going to provide you with parameter values, which can then help you uh, uh, execute that query. Uh, then you have the execution plans. Um, you have auto explain, PG Badger, PG Stat Monitor. Um, Planning and execution, timing statistics, PG Badger, stat monitor, and stat statements. Uh, query timing execution histogram is just PG stat monitor. Block reads and writes, it's um, the usual suspects, Badger, statements, and monitor. Weight event and locks is PG Badger and stat activity. Unfortunately, this is where uh, it's very hard to accumulate that information. Uh, so you, you can't really pick up that weight events and locks. Uh, in stat statements or monitor. And finally, SQL interface, which is stat activity, monitor, and uh, statements. One of the values we uh, really um, uh, share is that uh, we want to keep our uh, source code open uh, and we want to keep it flexible so that uh, there's always that freedom of choice for people. Thank you so much. Let me know if you have any questions.